No matter what kind of week you've had, this is the day that the Lord has made and we can rejoice and be glad in it. Did you know when you're rejoicing, you welcome the presence of God and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, freedom. So we just welcome your presence, Holy Spirit. We welcome you and we thank you in each one of our homes, in our living rooms, wherever we are. We thank you that you're with us, you're for us, you're on our side. You're making us the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. And we receive your help right now as we approach this amazing subject in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is part two of Yes, Heaven is Real. <laughs> we could just stop right there and that's good news, isn't it? Yes, Heaven is real. This is for your children. This is for your great grandparents. This is for you. Doesn't matter who you are. This message is for you. Yes, heaven is real. In part one, we realize that without a clear vision of heaven, it throws all of our navigation for accurate living on life on earth out of whack. We don't want that. We become pop culture puppets living aimlessly. Paul the Apostle, he gives us a radically clear view of a fearless, heaven-focused life on earth. Look at Philippians 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live, and to die is gain. Did I hear that right? He said it. And to die is gain, for I will be with him, Christ, in eternity. Oh, Paul's got an attitude, doesn't he? He's got an amazing living on earth, aggressive, possess the land attitude. Why? Because he's got heaven built into his heart. He goes on to say that being with Christ in heaven is, I love this, far, far better. See, he's got a vision of what's to come. He's not discontent, but he's got a vision of what's to come and he's living with Jesus in his heart, heaven in his heart. Do we know that, know that what that far, far better might be? Can we truly even begin to imagine far, far better? So let's kick off this edition of Yes, Heaven is Real, drilling down on Jesus' words. Let's start with Jesus' words. We kind of touched on this in part one, but let's go deeper right now. Go with me to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let's get the whole picture right now. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. Distressed. Don't let them be agitated. Oh, some of you right now, you just need to hear that again. Jesus is saying this to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, distressed, agitated. You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and adhere to, trust, and rely on also me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. And when I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Oh, Jesus, he's, man, he's got plans. This is big. This is a big deal. And verse four, and to the place where I'm going, you know the way. Well, then Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said this to him. He said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by and through me. Oh my goodness, praise God. You see, there is a lot of trouble, distress and agitation in the world, a lot of agitation in the world right now. I even hear Christians talking and I hear their hearts being squeezed, troubled, agitated. And it's interesting to note that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's victorious over all the world. And yet so many of us have allowed our hearts to be troubled like the disciples. We've allowed it. We've permitted distress and agitation to have access to our hearts, even though we have the Prince of all peace. And I've got to meet, I've got to admit it. I've done this. There have been times that I've allowed the trouble and agitation in the world to come in on the inside of me. I've permitted it. Even though Philippians 4 verse 7 tells us that God's peace can and will, quote, mount a guard over our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. But like any protective device or shield, you can have it, but that's not the same as using it, is it? Right? Seatbelts. I mean, they don't work hanging beside you in the back of your shoulder, right? I mean, you got to put them on. 
Think of this, if you're cutting steel or wood and refuse to wear the protective eyewear, it immediately tells us two things. First, you're not really aware of the danger. Secondly, you really don't understand the value of what's at stake. You can lose something that's very, very precious and invaluable. I saw a picture of a man, listen to this, he was wearing a mask to protect himself from you know, any contagions or virus. And right over his mouth, he had burned a tiny hole in the fabric of his mask so that he could push his cigarette through the hole so he could keep smoking. And then there was a caption over his picture and it said this, when you care about your health, but you don't care about your health. <laughs> I kind of laughed at first, but then the sad reality hit me. This is a strange type of motto or life principle that our generation, our culture, wears around its neck as we sort of parade through this moment in history. It's an intoxicated mindset. We care, but we don't care. We, we sort of, we're sort of invested, but we're really not invested. We say we love life and we want to live, but then do everything that we can to abandon it and cut it off. It's like we're so in love with the idea of life that we can't stand the idea of losing life. So we're in this non-conscious race to end it so we don't have to be anxious about it anymore. <laughs> now you might say, Pastor Stephen, that's crazy. Who, I mean, who in their right mind would think like that? Well, we all do. Every time we place our hope in this life alone, you think what the Bible terms as carnal thinking, crazy thinking, sinful thinking. We do this when we become ignorant or blinded to truth, the absolutes of truth. The moment we choose preference over the principle of God's word. Think about the text we just read from John 14. Jesus is talking to his disciples. It's Jesus talking to his disciples and they are all standing around the son of God, the creator of all creation. Jesus is in the house, right? He's right there beside them, and they are what, happy? No, they're troubled. They're joy-filled? No, no, they're distressed. They're agitated. They're troubled, seriously troubled. Can you relate to that? Have you ever felt like you've got Jesus in your life, but you're still majorly troubled, unhappy? How does Jesus go about fixing the disciples' anxiety problem? Because it's a problem. How does he lift them out of their, their, their dysfunction and their, their sadness and their sorrow? He fixes their perspective. They have Jesus with them, but they have an earthly perspective. Jesus has to fix their perspective. You see, they didn't have a lack of Jesus problem. Maybe you don't have a lack of Jesus problem. You might, but maybe you don't have a lack of Jesus problem. Maybe you're like them. Maybe you have a perspective problem. We find out that these guys had their own agenda for Jesus and were wishing upon a star. Oh, Jesus, we're wishing upon a star that he was there to fix this world. Matthew wanted Jesus to fix the political problems. Peter probably wanted Jesus to fix the economy. Well, we know Jesus wanted Jesus to do a TV show, a reality TV show, and start um, selling T-shirts and monetizing. Judas was probably like, you should have monetized the whole walking on water thing. We could have made some money off of that. Andrew wants Jesus to spearhead universal health care. Come on, Jesus. Everybody's got their cause. Everybody's got their idea of what Jesus should do. Their perspective was one of fix this world and we'll be happy. Fix this world and we won't be troubled anymore. Finally, we can sing that Stephen Marshall song. Well, it's all right. It's all right. Have you ever thought that? Not, not about the Stephen Marshall song, but have you ever thought that if Jesus would just fix these things on earth, then I'll be happy? Oh, if Jesus would just fix my world, I'll be happy. Finally, make, make me a success in my career and then I'll be happy. Jesus, give me a whole lot more money, then I'll be happy. Jesus, make it so my family isn't acting crazy, then I'll be happy. Jesus, just make me healthy and wealthy and then I'll be happy. Fix this world, fix the government, fix the economy, fix my wife, fix my husband, fix my parents. Why don't you just fix my boss, Lord? What? My neighborhood, fix my roof then I'll be happy. 
And you see, there's nothing wrong with praying for every circumstance in life, situations we're supposed to. In fact, we should pray for people. We should be praying for our leaders. 1 Timothy 2, 2 tells us to pray for those in authority that we may live a peaceable, undisturbed life. But we tend to want Jesus to make His number one agenda our number one agenda. Instead of us aligning our perspective with His Word and His agenda, which is... God's will done on earth as it is in, let me hear you say it, heaven, heaven. Heaven is real. Jesus has an agenda. It's the heaven agenda. It's the kingdom of heaven agenda. He came here to do something and then to go someplace. Jesus came here to save you, to save me, to save us all, not the world's man-made systems. Jesus came to save you. Jesus did not come to save our government's economy or environments. Jesus came to save us, to save our lives, our family, and then go where? Go to the Father and do what? Well, let's ask Jesus again. John 14, verses 2 and 3. He he says, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. And when I go and make ready for a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Where Jesus is, it's amazing. It's beautiful. As Paul said, it's far, far better. If our perspective is earthly only, we quickly become lost. We become hopeless, even in the presence of Jesus. Even in the presence of Jesus, the disciples became lost and hopeless. They were given Jesus authority to do Jesus' works, but they lacked agenda. They lacked the plan, the heaven plan. Heaven's legislation works on earth. Did you hear me? Heaven's legislation works on earth. In fact, it works earth. It always has, it always will. That's why Jesus could easily walk on water. He was programmed and accustomed to and knew the program of heaven, the agenda, the, um, the ways of heaven on earth. That's why Jesus said, pray this way. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's talk a little GPS talk here. The world's never lost system. Do you realize that every day, every second, people on earth use a thing called trilateration to accurately get directions, measure speed, and predict, or shall we say prophesy, their time of arrival, their ETA, at a target destination? Now, Stephen, how could this be? What kind of mystic power doth thou useth? Well, it's called GPS, and it works off of this thing I told you about called trilateration. You're on earth and needing to go, let's say, 100 miles to grandma's house on 211 Maple Street. You can't see, you can't see these satellites, but they're orbiting 11,000 miles above the earth and they broadcast a signal. Your receiver in your car or your phone gets that signal and that signal simply, it's, it's simply a measurement of distance. Then it happens two more times with two more satellites. From those simple measurements, simple measurements, your location on earth is accurately, accurately directed right to your grandmother's house. Think of it this way. You use sky perspective that's not even one twentieth of the distance to the moon from earth to find your way to grandma's house or even a new burger joint across town. That's right. If in the natural world, 11,000 miles above us helps us navigate a one mile trip what coordinates can we use to help navigate the spiritual, to help navigate um, mortality into immortality? Well, Pastor Stephen, I've, I've got the Holy Spirit living within me. That's perfect. I love that answer. That's a great answer. Just as long as you realize this, that the Holy Spirit uses heaven's coordinates to guide you in earthly affairs. What? what, what where did you get that? Huh? Go with me to Ephesians 2, verse 6. And He raised us up together with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is while we're on earth. He's raised us up together with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Think about those satellites in the natural. You get a perspective from 11,000 miles up in the sky while you're on earth. Why would you think this is phenomenal? 
Colossians 3, verse 2. Look at Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your minds. We're told, we're instructed by Paul the Apostle. Set your mind and keep focused habitually. It's almost like he's saying, get your mind set on the, the heavenly um, satellite. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on earth, which have only temporal value. Oh, I, Pastor Stephen, I don't want to be one of those people that's so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. Do you think that way when you punch in coordinates on your GPS? Of course not. You need those built-in space references that are 11,000 miles away to give you a correct turn-by-turn -turn that's just even 50 feet away. Mark Twain said this. He said, let us swear while we may, for in heaven it will not be allowed. <laughs> you see, Psalm 16 says that at God's right hand are pledges forevermore. Our complete ignorance of a true heaven shows up in the foolish, stupid things that we seem to hold so dear as markers of freedom. That is somehow cussing represents our freedom. That's how foolish we, we end up. And I'm not trying to point my finger just at Mark Twain, but that's how silly we become when we don't have the reality of who we really are. Let me ask you a few questions. It, is it possible that you're not making the right turns in life because every time the Holy Spirit tries to set your mind above, you're insisting on finding your way without His heavenly coordinates? Are you trying to live life accurately today with no accurate perspective or coordinates on eternity? You see, this is not an indictment. This shouldn't, um, this shouldn't in any way make you feel less of a person, but it should convince us. You know, that word convict also means to convince and persuade us of better things. People in heaven are aware of us on earth. Did you know that? Are we aware of those in heaven? The Bible makes it clear that those in heaven are aware of what's going on on earth. Even the martyrs in the book of Revelation 6 know that God hasn't judged their persecutors yet. That means there is a consciousness of history in heaven. There is a consciousness of time and season. There is a passion for justice in heaven because they cry out to God for something that hasn't happened yet. And that means that those in heaven have a concern for what's going on on earth until we reach the final judgment and Jesus returns to rule and reign on earth. And of course, afterwards, as it says in Isaiah 65, Verse 17 in Revelation 21, God makes a new heaven and a new earth, which is where the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven to rest on earth. No sin, no sickness, no death, no sorrow. All things are made new. You see, people in heaven are not ignorant of those on earth. But what is our perspective of heaven? Imagine being born into a dark, ugly dungeon. It's all you know. The light that comes in through your cell window is your only experience with illumination. Now Jesus walks into your cell to set you free, but you need to trust him. Otherwise, he can't even get you out of your present state. So he does a miracle or two in your cell. He provides for you. But the most valuable thing that Jesus gives you is his word, his promise for a future free from bondage and living in the Father's house. But you know, your known reality is only this present place. So then you start praying prayers like, oh, Jesus, can't you just fix my, my bunk bed here and, and make it a little softer? Jesus, can you turn these bars of iron into bars of gold? That might be pretty. Jesus, can you just make it smell better in here? That's probably a good prayer. Jesus, make this place beautiful. You see, this is your world and it's familiar. Freedom scares all of us. Freedom can scare us because we're afraid to even imagine what's beyond the familiar, this world. My friend, we tend to pray from our perspective and we tend to live out of our perspective. Jesus came to set us free and to also take us somewhere in reality that we've never been. It takes courage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says this, For as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has the human heart imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. What God has prepared. Did you get that? Has. Past tense. 
God has prepared for you. God has not arrived at this day unprepared to bless you or for your family, for those you love and care about. God has got an amazing, he's got amazing things for you and a place for you, for your loved ones, for your family, for your friends. God's prepared and this is not the landing place. Oh, it's a nice, it can be a beautiful transitional place, but it's not your landing. But if our perspective is one of God, this journey, this transitional place is my home. So come fix this and fix that. We tend to stay stuck in our faith, stuck in our minds and our hearts. And like Jesus' disciples in John 14, troubled, distressed, upset, anxious. Do a little reverse engineering. Are you troubled, distressed, anxious? Just maybe you've traded your heavenly perspective for a complete 100% earthly perspective. Jesus came to save us, but the plan is not to pause eternity, sit down in this present mess and just watch us die. A life perspective built only on this mortality is truly a stuck, futile life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. I love this. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature, and this mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, freedom from death. See, we're going someplace, you and me. We're going someplace. We're not just putting off mortality. We're putting on immortality. We get to put on immortality in Christ Jesus. We're going someplace. We're not called to a low, dark, troubled perspective, thinking hopeless thoughts, waiting for death. No, 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 no. We're called to victorious thinking and peace and joy that comes from knowing. Knowing what? That God the Father loves you. Jesus has prepared a place for you. And that, yes, heaven is real. Oh, I got to give you one more verse. John 8, verse 51. I assure you, Jesus said, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone observes my teaching, lives in accordance with my message, keeps my word, he will by in no means ever see and experience death. Oh, man, that's got to make you praise the Lord. The entertainment business is lying to you about eternity, about life after this life. I'll say it again. Yes, heaven is real. Without that perspective and that faith, that reality in your life, your life becomes miserable, hopelessly lacking. Every shield you try to wrap around yourself is a mask with a hole for your, for your cigarette, right? Just, it's just crazy. It's foolish. You make an effort to save yourself while at the same time throwing yourself off the cliff. Without Jesus and his perspective, Again, it's a package deal. So let me repeat myself. Without Jesus and his perspective of eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him, without that com combination of hope, you are of all people miserable and hopeless. Not because God wants you that way. No, God so loves you. He so loved you that he's already given. He's given his best his only begotten son to die on a cross for you and me in our place so that we might have eternal life. But if our perspective is, oh God, you've got to save this environment. Oh God, you've got to save this economy. Oh God, you've got to save this government. You don't just have a worldly perspective. It's robbing you of God's peace. You've got a non-heaven perspective. It's contradicting your design. It makes you miserable. Heaven is where God lives. Heaven is where God's throne is. It's not a vapor or a fluffy cloud, but it's a real place. It's the birthing room for every blueprint and design for this physical world's existence. That's right, this world is only a fractional reflection of the real world, God's home. Jesus told us to pray this way. I want to bring you back to Matthew 6. He said, pray therefore like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look, we're on assignment to bring heaven to earth. 
You're called to bring blessings, healings, God treasures. God works signs and wonders from heaven to earth, but you won't do that if you're not source-minded, heavenly source-minded, heaven-conscious, supernaturally aware. Life doesn't move from the natural to the supernatural. It moves from the supernatural to the natural. Faith moves mountains. Mountains don't move faith. You might say, Pastor Stephen, I want that. I want to live with that hope in my heart. I want to live with that reality in my life. Let me remind you of this 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. The apostle asks this question, and it's like I feel like he's mocking the grave and death. He says, O oh, grave, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? My friend, when the devil threatens you with death, then you can stand on the promises of life. When the earth shakes and the mountains fall into the sea, when war threatens and disaster is all CNN can talk about, then turn to the good news of Jesus Christ who said, I'm going to my father's house. I'm preparing a place for you, a home for you, good things for you. Why are we agitated? Why are we troubled? Even with Jesus in the room, even with Jesus walking on the water beside us in the boat. Because it's not enough to know He saved you. you got to know what it's for, where you're going. Yes, you've got a purpose here on earth. Yes, He's got plans for you here on earth, right here, right now. But the landing place, the real reward, the real reward ceremony, the ultimate glory of all glories, the heavenly championship is the place Jesus said He was going to. My Father's house. Yes, Heaven is real, and you can have that assurance right now because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. All your sins are forgiven. You are a child of God, and heaven can be your home. With your confession, use your faith to legislate some heaven here on earth. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me. You rose up from the grave. Now you reign as King of Kings. You conquered death for me. Heaven is my home. So I get to represent your kingdom here on earth. Help me, Holy Spirit. Guide me as a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is so exciting. Before God, you legally had the right to represent the King of Kings with power and authority in this world, on this earth. You're a child of God and a carrier of His love and His light. Go to the Jesus button right now on our website and please let us know how that we can be praying for you, for your family, for your situation. We have life tools that you can access on our website, like our Life Talks podcast, which is free to you. Pam and I, we read the book of Proverbs to you and other great devotionals that will just help encourage and strengthen you so that you can live life strong.